I've taken the power of darkness and put them on my head. Some of the iguanas lean far over my shoulder and stare at passers-by. Others strain their necks upward toward God knows what. Below the scales and claws and beady eyes, my face is wrapped. This headdress is wider than the path I walk on, and you'd better clear the way. If I look down abruptly, they will fall and crash apart. But for now, they glare at everything while I convey them to you. The dress I wear is scattered with flying mariposas on a black background. The ground is all. Um, I'm Colleen Anderson, and this is Irene McKinney, West Virginia's Poet Laureate. I guess I'd like to begin. I am curious about where your earliest desires to be a poet. When, when did that happen? How did that happen? Where were you? What brought you to poetry? Well, I, uh, like with most poets, I'm sure it was gradual, but there were certain very specific circumstances that I think kicked it off. One of them was that I grew up in a fairly traditional farm family, and most of the people I grew up around uh, really didn't talk a great deal. And they especially didn't talk about um, intimate things or personal things. And I remember thinking, um, maybe when I was 10 or so, that I wish uh, that there were so many things that needed to be said that nobody said. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt this pressure all the time of the unsaid. And I think another thing was, um, I grew up in what was essentially like the 19th century. Uh, we lived in an isolated farmhouse. We had no central heat. We didn't have electricity until I was three. Uh, of course, no running water, no bathroom, none of those conveniences, and certainly no television, even though uh, those were starting to appear around as I was growing up. And so the natural thing to do for entertainment was to read. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, was primarily a farmer, but he also taught occasionally in one-room schools. And um, because of that connection, I think he was able to convey to us books were awfully valuable and that education itself was extremely valuable. And I've heard you say that there, were, there weren't very many books in your household. No, there really weren't. So the ones that were there were especially precious to me. And it seemed to me, uh, all the time I was growing up, I was always poking around, like we'd go to visit someone, and I would say, do you have any old books anywhere? And most people would say, yeah, well, we probably have a box out in the barn somewhere. And they'd send me out there to retrieve some kind of strange collection of old things that accumulated over the years. and were covered with mouse droppings and straw, and I would haul them away like treasure. Yeah, yeah. So I would read literally anything. <laughs> and uh, my father had a book called uh, The Care and Maintenance of Farm Machinery. I remember the book very clearly. It was a blue cloth cover with a sort of red outline picture of a tractor. <laughs> and I read that just because it was in print. There was no other reason. Yes. It, it just that print itself was so magical because you could be sitting in a farmhouse kitchen, open a book, and you were in this whole other mental yeah. world. Um, so I have uh, a lot of masks on my wall and uh, a few years ago, uh, I was very ill, and I was confined to my bed, and I set the bed up in the living room so I wouldn't have to walk up and down the stairs. I just wasn't able to. And I had a few masks on the wall already. And I'd be lying there at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning, having a lot of pain, looking at these masks, and I studied each one of them. 
and sort of try to live into what psychological and spiritual uh, context it wanted to move me into. And I started to get a lot more familiar with them. And one of the things I learned at that point was, you know, if you have, like a lot of these masks here, we walk past and say, that's really scary, that's really upsetting to look at, you know? Some of them are quite terrifying, I think, at the first glance. And a lot of the ones I had in my house were scary. But what happened gradually, as I looked at them and thought about the spiritual and psychological content of that, I came to realize that whatever it is that we make as art objects and put out into the world necessarily comes out of us. So it's already in there. So there's no use to get freaked out about it, right? <laughs> it's already there. It's not something that the world just threw at us. If we feel that immediate recognition, that means that stuff's in us in some form. I look at them, and even though they're frightening, some of them, they're, they're scary, they're, they're odd faces, but they're faces. Mm -hmm. We share that. Mm -hmm. And they have something to tell me, just as I have something That's to right. express myself. Any visage, a representation of a visage, is part of the human. Yeah. And even though, as you say, it may be grotesque or frightening, it is human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or animal, or yes. that, or that yes, about that us too. that we recognize, we share. Yeah. Yeah. The animal part of it is a very important part of it. And all human beings, for some way to have a communion with the animal world and also the vegetable world. Um, and so in urban societies, we're almost completely cut off from it. Well, the one thing I think about masks and persona poems is um, the challenge for me as a poet is always to find a way to open up deeper and deeper doors and also to try to prevent myself from uh, prettifying my experience and uh, codifying it or pushing it toward some traditional meaning or understanding because it to me that moves away from discovery. Mm -hmm. I would say that masks and literary masks in the form of persona uh, push us or can push us toward some really difficult understandings. Mm -hmm. That would be so easy to just not acknowledge. Right, right. To just stay away from. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I I think I, I, I want to thank you so much well, for taking you. this time with me. Thank you, Colleen. And I, that part is in her voice, so I have the mask on. Now I take the mask off and speak in my own voice. And if I say that I admire her stance, you might ask what I mean. I mean, she carries what she can never understand. She carries what we are repulsed by. She carries the grimace, the rictus smile of the iguana. I mean, she carries me away. She stares through clouds and becomes cloudy. And I follow her gaze, which goes upward and stays bemused in spite of all that bears down on her. Some are cold. One is murderous. Others are oblivious. Some crouch down. Our reptile mind pulsates beneath the reptile bodies. They are our kin and alien to the bone. The Komodo, the Copperhead, they shine. We think we could escape them, but we don't. We think we have the means to crush them, but we don't. We come as close as we can and then pull back and try again. A girl in my class once began to scream when I read a story with a black snake in it. I can't stand it, she told us. It's always been this way, you have to understand. We did, so I stopped reading, hoping that tomorrow she would have more strength to listen. Her thin hands fluttered about her face, and her eyes were wild with fear. She stood and sat and stood again, about to run. I want her to see this photograph, to see how one may carry 
when they lift and carry pounds of icy flesh and bone. I want to carry all this icy flesh and bone. I want to walk out in the public square with the unknown on my head and not blink or shuffle. I want to have a gaze as translucent as water or the shine from scales. To don the headdress for this ritual. To bear it through the ceremony and no longer because I know it must be temporary. The weight unwieldy, the effect bizarre. And the people around me will nod and look away and look back again at something so familiar they think they're dreaming and then they know they're not. The piles of vegetables around me glow in reds and greens. The peppers fat with flesh and sheen. The apples shining in their reddish skins. The onions and garlic sending out signals of smell. The heraldic meats hanging in display. The sepia barley, wheat, the grain of, grains of corn in heaps. And through them, among them, our lady walks the dusty aisles. <laughs>